Good afternoon. Welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery. I'm Stephanie Wiles, the Henry J. Heinz II Director. We all know, whoops. <laughs> we all know that spring has truly arrived in New Haven when John Walsh is back and we're about to set off on a new adventure together. Today, John kicks off a four-part series on Henri Matisse, based as always in close looking and a deep study of artistic breakthroughs, John's contributions to our appreciation and understanding of artists like Van Gogh, Picasso, and Mondrian are unrivaled. In person and online, his lectures have reached hundreds of thousands of people. For those of you who are new to the audience or new on listening online, John Walsh graduated from Yale College in 1961 and earned his PhD from Columbia University. His curatorial expertise was honed at the Frick Collection, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and in Boston as curator of paintings at the Museum of Fine Arts. During his remarkable tenure as director of the Getty Museum, John built up the collections, he built up the staff, he oversaw the creation of a new and magnificent museum and campus, and began the planning of the Getty Villa. John is a legendary teacher. Each fall, he returns to Yale to work with our education department and the Wordle Gallery teachers who lead our K-12 tours. John's commitment to nurturing aspiring teachers and scholars greatly benefits all of us here in the New Haven community and at Yale, and we are just so grateful to him for what he does for us. Today's lecture is generously sponsored by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectures Fund. Thank you all for being here today in the spring rain um, that we're having now, and for those of you online. And John, over to you. I want to welcome you all, and I mean by all, I'm not just talking about you here in the room, whom I love, but also, uh, I'm told, five, four times the number of people who are seeing this on live stream. Um, this is a real uh, testament to the gallery, I think, and to this very exciting program of public events that the gallery sponsors so generously. Now, Matisse. Um, this is an artist whom everybody has heard of, um, and uh, for some of you, this is actually an introduction to Matisse. Um, for others, though, it's a reintroduction. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to be useful to all of you. Um, Matisse, you, you realize, shares credit with Picasso and Mondrian, and you could, in a stretch, say Kandinsky and Duchamp for pioneering modern art. In these four lectures, I'm going to take you through the phases of Matisse's career, each time looking closely at a painting that's not far from here, in some cases upstairs, but in any case, in a day's trip, so that you'll want to go and see for yourself. He had a career that was 60 years long and was enormously productive. His work is full of delights and discoveries and astonishments and puzzles. It's been studied by generations of writers, so there's a huge and excellent literature on Matisse. Um, it's, I've depended on it desperately uh, for ideas and judgments. I put the most important titles of this literature, uh, whether they're new books or easily gotten through the uh, online uh, used books services. Uh, and I've also put on the website the links, uh, some links to major museum collections of Matisse and some videos. And so you should feel free to use those. But um, let's now plunge right in. Um, our entry into Matisse is this painting uh, in the gallery upstairs, painted in 1906 when he was 36. I want us to just have a leisurely stroll through it, a look at it um, in some detail, and then I'll come back and talk to you.
Well, I think we can take it in fairly quickly. Um, there's a tabletop uh, with an orange, a lemon, or lemons, a melon in the middle, some small green things, which my wife Jill says are peppers, um, and, there's a, and two uh, ceramic bowls. There's a white plaster statue of a young woman. And behind that, flowers, some pink and red blossoms and green leaves. In the center, uh, near the top, there's a little cluster of white stabs with the brush that might be a flower, abbreviated, cut loose uh, from the bouquet. All of this in an interior space that's just suggested, not spelled out. The right-hand quarter of the picture could suggest a translucent blue curtain, and it partly revealing a sort of hot red vertical patch of something beyond. Down on the table, uh, if we try to trace the edges, uh, we can do that pretty well until they disappear, until they disappear behind the statue and the melon, where we encounter a kind of purple cloud. We'd expect a vase there to hold the flowers, but instead there's this floating uh, purple zone uh, that's just the beginning uh, of the floating patches of color that occupy the top third of the picture and can't easily be recognized. They function like the blossoms. The patches play around behind the white plaster statue. They sort of caress the edges and peep out from between her arm and her side. So some things in the picture we can identify and some things not. They are abstracted forms and they add color and variety and life to the image. Now, as to the flowers and the missing vase, I think the painting on the right was based on the same setup, but it's focused on the bouquet. In the Yale painting, the bouquet is upstaged by the fruit and the statue. And Matisse has given it a muted, slightly grayer tonality. Now, there's a reason for all this, I think. In order to paint the Yale still life, Matisse used his flower piece as part of the setup. Our uh, master digital manipulator here at the Yale Gallery, John French, um, has helped me to be sure of that by visualizing what Matisse would have seen. His finished flower piece at the right propped up behind the table. That was the basis for the Yale painting at the left. A little game of appearances, uh, and as you'll see, not the first kind of deception in Matisse's work. There are a few other things here in the still life we can recognize in other paintings of the same period and earlier. Here's a, a tablecloth in the middle with a black center uh, serving as a hanging on the wall it's much bigger, um, and there's also that melon in the middle. <laughs> At the right, the red and black cloth, um, again, uh, back on the table with the same cup and spoon. He paints it from above, uh, tilting it at you, so at a steep angle, and floating uh, in no place we can recognize. The statue um, is a piece of his own that he'd been working on recently uh, in plaster. It hasn't yet been cast in bronze. We're going to see that Matisse put great energy in studying nude models in drawings and in clay and plaster for most of his career. He's going to subject them to all kinds of exaggerations and abbreviations. Here they're very gentle ones uh, based on his work in clay. He puts her at the edge, but he pulls her into the composition with diagonals that rhyme with the stems of, and the leaves. Her long, narrow shape 
balances also the vertical shapes uh, on the far right. I mean, Mat Matisse thought through all of this and adjusted it with great care. By including a plaster cast in his still life paintings, uh, Matisse was following tradition. I mean, this is a Cezanne, a, a table with fruit and a statuette by a 17th century sculptor. And as for flowers, Matisse was joining a long lineage in French art. Flower pieces were a challenge to composition and color, as well as being a pretty reliable source of income. Artists were urged to study pictures in the Louvre, where there were lots of great examples like these from the 17th and 18th century. The great bouquet by the Dutch painter uh, Jan van Huysum on the left, a carefully painted melee of flowers in a state of decline, uh, or uh, in the middle, the bright bouquets of Anne voilet Coster in the middle, um, or at the right, uh, a much more vigorous brushwork that Delacroix applied to the blossoms. Painters of the generation before Matisse, like Monet and Renoir, uh, became much more adventuresome in their compositions. Uh, in the middle, Odillon Redon made intensely colored arrangements and painted them mainly in pastel. Uh, Matisse had bought one of these Redon flower pieces six years earlier. These um, are all by Matisse, amazingly, at the same time uh, as our still life. Um, he was using flower pieces as a kind of testing ground not just for color, but for painting techniques. At the far left, um, a pointless application of painting. In the center, um, a kind of suggestive fluidity. And in the bouquet at the right, you saw a moment ago, forcefully saturated colors. There were some quirky still lives, too. The most surprising uh, for me being the one on the right, uh, trying out a kind of faux naive simplicity with a, a folk-like ceramics and downstage uh, a quartet of sprouting onions. In the summer of 1906, the year of all these experiments with still life, Matisse uh, was established already in the eyes of traditionalists uh, as a radical, as a danger to art. They saw him as the newest leader in the progressive destruction of traditional values, of discipline and faithfulness to nature, a successor to Cezanne and Gauguin and Seurat. The year before, he and some friends had exhibited paintings that pushed color so far that a half-joking critic uh, called them fauves, wild beasts. Let's step back and see how Matisse got to this point. He was born in 1869, and he grew up in the town of Bourin, at the left there, where the Blue Arrow is, 90 miles north of Paris, 25 miles from the Belgian border, in the gently rolling flatlands of French Flanders, where people grew sugar beets and worked in factories weaving cloth. This was a time of rapid change and industrialization, especially after the military defeat of France by the Germans in 1870. His father was a prosperous seed merchant, hardworking with a demanding personality. Matisse said about his mother, she loved everything I did. She encouraged his painting as a child, and he drew in sketchbooks, he took violin lessons, he designed and operated a toy theater. And much later, he remembered traveling fairs and how he wanted to perform like the actors and the musicians that he'd seen. After all, he said, an artist is an exhibitionist. He wasn't much of a student. At 12, he was sent away to school, but left in 1887, suffering from colitis. At 17, he proposed to his parents that he should study law in the Sorbonne. He did, and he said that the law was Hebrew to me. <laughs> Still, he came back and served a term as a law clerk, not successfully. 
It was boring in Bohain. It was commercial and unbeautiful, and the weather was terrible. The cheerful picture with the tour bus here at the, at the right shows the family shop nowadays, and the house serving these uh, nowadays as a, as a shrine to Matisse. Matisse was happy to get away, but he never lost his love for the main product of the town and the region, fabrics, textiles, which made the place famous. Every kind of patterned silk and velvet in profusion, luxury fabrics that supplied the couture houses in Paris. His excellent uh, biographer, uh, Hilary Sperling, is convinced that Manet's uh, and Matisse is growing up with uh, this abundance of textiles all around him, helped to give him the taste for them we see in his paintings too later on. There wasn't much else for his visual imagination in his hometown. Sperling makes it clear that late adolescence for Matisse was a real burden. He was a victim of the repressive social conventions of the time and, and place. Uh, respectable girls were distant and impossible. He had fantasies of odalisque, uh, who weren't to be had either in Bois-Bois. He, he struggled with his father, and he was sick again, much worse than before. But when his mother brought him a paint box, he saw an alpine landscape on it, and he describes what happened. I felt a great indifference to everything my parents tried to make me do. From the moment I held a box of colors in my hand, I knew this was my life. Like an animal that plunges headwards towards what it, what it loves, I dived in to the understandable despair of my father. It was a tremendous attraction, a sort of paradise found in which I was completely free, at peace. Matisse taught himself to paint, went on to the local free art classes, and announced to his family that he was going to be an artist. His father refused to think of such a thing. But when his teachers interceded, he got a grudging stipend from his father of the equivalent of $20 a month for a trial period in October 1891. And then, with two friends, he took the train to Paris. He had an introduction to William Bouguereau, who was the leading academic artist of the time, who was rich and famous and skillful and slick, who sent him to the Académie, uh, the Académie Julien, a sort of prep school for the Academy of Fine Arts. Matisse drew copies of plaster casts and for the first time ever got to work with nude models. This practice of life drawing was the foundation of his entire career as an artist, he insisted later. At the time, he said that he saw himself as a failure as an art student, but that a visit to a museum in Lille changed him. He said, when I saw the Goyas at Lille, that was where I understood that painting couldn't, could be a language. I thought that I could be a painter. He didn't get admitted to the academy. But he did catch the attention of Gustave Moreau, who was encouraging and invited Matisse to become a student of his own atelier, where he studied for six more years. Moreau uh, was close to the end of his career as, a, as the greatest French painter of the symbolist movement. What you see is Moreau's enormous scene uh, from the climax of, of, the, of the epic of uh, where Odysseus returns to kill the suitors uh, for, for uh, Penelope, which he struggled with off and on for 40 years and left unfinished. Here's a sketch by Matisse of a life class. Moro was an eccentric, uh, curmudgeonly, but honest as a teacher. He was the first who actually inspired Matisse who wrote that Moro didn't set pupils on the right track. He took them off it. <laughs> he made them uneasy, he said. Other teachers stuck to the studio, but Moreau took them to the Louvre, and um, 
became what we would call around here a gallery teacher, uh, discussing paintings one by one. The students copied paintings too, and Mon uh, Moro coached them. Um, he didn't show us how to paint, Matisse said. He roused our imagination in front of the life that he found in these paintings. He copied paintings by Sharda. Um, Moreau had recommended them to him and told him, be sure to note one thing, which is that color has to be thought, passed through the imagination. If you have no imagination, you will never produce beautiful color. And he said, the painting that lasts is the one that has been thought about, dreamt over, reflected on, produced from mind, and not just by the hand's facility at dabbing on highlights with the tip of the brush. Well, that was a lesson that stuck with Matisse all his life and shaped his art. That's what gives a painting, he said, what gives a painting life is not facility, but the strength of the artist's engagement with the subject. Matisse was keeping well clear of Impressionism, uh, the art of capturing fleeting effects of light and shade, in favor of study and discipline and restraint. Still life, which was Chardin's specialty, let him see and reveal the structure of the composition without its small details. Moreau uh, sent him to study this still life too, and he never forgot it. In fact, he came back to it several times. 20 years later, uh, during a prolonged test of whether he could adapt to cubism, Matisse painted an enormous composition based on the Deheim once more. We'll come back to that picture later. In 1894, Matisse could afford to move to a rundown building with a view of the, to the River Seine. It had a, river, a studio for himself and a room uh, for his companion, Camille Jobreau, and their new baby called Marguerite, who was going to be important to him for 60 more years. He was still living there six years later, and having had some success, Five paintings he'd, paintings he'd uh, submitted to the jury of the Salon uh, de la Nationale in 1896. Uh, uh, Five paintings were accepted, and the one on the left actually was bought by the French state. A small, a tidy composition, nicely balanced, of Camille was seen from the back in the corner, filled with bric-a-brac, uh, another still life, all seen in diffuse light, all sensitively painted with mild colors. It's all about the security of the familiar and the quiet pleasure of the known and the reliable. Its style doesn't give the slightest hint of Matisse's work to come. But the subject matter was going to be central to his art. Visiting the coast of Brittany in the following summer, Matisse painted this picture of a plain interior with a view out the door to a dazzling exterior. This was a motif, um, motif that Matisse was going to use uh, for years to come. The artist inside a protected zone and suggesting the boundless outside. This was the first of two visits to islands that were going to change his life as a painter first to Belle-Isle off the Brittany coast up there uh, in the blue circle, where many artists for several generations had been coming in the summers. And then in the following year, down there in red, Corsica in the Mediterranean, on Belle-Isle with his little family, Matisse broadened and loosened his way of painting. At the left-hand side, black and white, almost, have become, or become uh, technicolor, almost, in the middle, in the space of a, one summer, a fellow artist who had known Matisse as a conservative, mainly tonal painter, came to see him this summer and wrote, oh, surprise, I found him at his window making a little study of a view across the harbor. 
His palette was now based on cobalt blue and crimson matter lake. There was no trace left of the blended, restrained, and somber tones that he'd favored until now. The design was set down in pure colors. Matisse has set out intrepidly on a new road, which had so frightened us. The small uh, oil sketches at the right uh, are in a higher key than before, and he's painting them much more freely. Indoors at the left, he makes a kind of tribute to Chardin, uh, out of the stuff on the table and the graceful road, uh, role of the maidservant, uh, all in a lighter and brighter vein. Matisse gave credit for this change to a man called John Peter Russell, a well-to-do Australian emigre painter who lived on the island. Russell was a generous, a kind of exuberant man who introduced him to Claude Monet's ideas about color and light and their interrelationships. Monet had come out to visit Russell on the island 10 years before, and he'd taught him a lot. Russell painted the picture in the middle from almost the same vantage point that Monet chose for the picture here on the right at Yale, which is a showcase for his technique of evoking light and shade with repeated broken strokes of contrasting and complementary colors. When Matisse came back the following summer, he was uh, in full impressionist mode. In the middle here, working with short strokes in lavender hues, and at the left, uh, making a weave of long colored strokes for the water and the cliffs. Back in Paris, um, his teacher Moreau had encouraged him to make a major painting for the Salon of the Soci Société Nationale in 1897, and he did. Monet, I mean, <clears throat> Matisse had been elected a member, and he exhibited this big still life with a maid and a table laden with glass and silver and fruit and flowers. The more conservative members didn't like it a bit, thinking he'd gone over to the other side, to the Impressionists. This is 1897, mind you. Um, in fact, um, Matisse had seen very little of the Impressionists at that point, or the post-Impressionists either, Cezanne, Seurat, Gauguin, and so. But one of the pioneer Impressionists, the venerable Camus Pizarro, told him the advice that Corot had given him. Very good, my friend. You are gifted work and don't listen to anything anyone tells you. <laughs> Nevertheless, he told Matisse to go and see the Turner paintings in London. He and Matisse went together to the Luxembourg Palace to see the exhibition of paintings by Impressionists that had been collected by Gustave Caivot. And there they saw these Monets. Monet really at his most original and powerful and suggestive as both a composer and a painter. What they suggested to Matisse took him some years to digest. After his relationship with his partner deteriorated, he met and married a woman from Toulouse called Amélie Perrer, a person of substance and education and energy. And she was going to be the mother of two boys, the stepmother of Marguerite, and one of his models, also manager of the business and closest confidant. Their honeymoon, however, seems to have been something of a, a business trip for, Ma, 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 for Matisse, who was, um, went to London right away to take Pizarro's advice and see the Turner paintings uh, for the first time. He put down his thoughts about Turner's struggles. He said, it is always a good thing to begin with renunciation, this is Matisse writing, to impose a regimen of abstinence on yourself from time to time. Turner lived in a cellar. Once a week, he had the shutters suddenly flung open. And then, what incandescence, what dazzlement, what jewels. The next step for Matisse was Corsica, 
uh, kind of at the time a very wild and remote place uh, with blazing sun, tropical plants he'd never seen before. Something of Turner's radiance had become part of him. He made more than 50 small oil sketches on Corsica that have a kind of abandon in the brushwork, kind of rejoicing in the colors and the shapes. Years later, he wrote, I decided to allow myself a year's respite. I wanted to reject all restraint and paint as if it seemed best to me. Before long, there came to me, like a revelation, a love of the materials of painting for their own sake. Growing within me, I felt the passion of color. That passion for color lies behind a whole series of still, still lifes at the turn of the century. They push beyond what he'd done before. They test the possibilities for brushwork and color. There was, by the way, uh, there was an unforgettable sequence of these still lifes in the great exhibition of 30 years ago. Some of you will have been there, uh, organized by the Museum of Modern Art and John Elderfield. Anyway, they begin here with a diagonal arrangement of fruit and glasses and bowls and a tablecloth. This time there's a flush of warm yellow light on the wall that makes a kind of confetti of yellow and blue spots. Each of them a stroke or a dab of the brush was picked up here or there, even in the cool blue-gray left side. Two years earlier in the picture you've just seen, he had described the whole setup more completely and carefully. In the orange still life, on the other hand, things are suggested more than described, and the play of light and the shade is much more subtle. And then a new experiment, now going all the way to dots, now fully pointillist. This is a technique that he'd been seeing others using during the past couple of years. Just to remind you, the public debut of the technique had been a dozen years earlier, demonstrated by Georges Surat on an enormous scale at the cost of vast labor <clears throat> at the Salon of Independent Artists of 1886. The Grand Jat enacted observations based on color theory that you could get a more true-to-life rendition of light and shade by using small uniform dots and short strokes of contrasting and sometimes complementary colors, separate rather than mixing them on the palette. And very quickly, Surat had followers, including one that Matisse knew already, Camille Pizarro, elderly but open-minded, who put aside his Impressionist style and adopted the next big thing, soon to be named Divisionism, or neo-impressionism. <clears throat> For a while, Vincent van Gogh did the same a year into his stay in Paris, but he didn't have the patience for applying <clears throat> a sea of little dots. So <clears throat> he allowed himself dashes as well. And pretty soon the dashes grew and he quit the dots. <laughs> this <clears throat> stippled way of working did a very good job of capturing the dazzle of Mediterranean sunlight. And several younger contemporaries of Matisse practiced it. This is Paul Signac at the right, and at the left, Henri Cross. In just a few years, Matisse was going to join them in working in this way for a while. Meanwhile, Matisse is still life didn't need a system to break down reflected light into small contrasting bits. In the painting on the right, he used color juxtapositions in his own way. Uh, <clears throat> here in the wall on the left and on the floor. And the composition gave a kind of graceful bow to Cezanne, the greatest master of still life of his time, who not only gave Matisse a model for subjects like this, but also gave permission to tilt tabletops, do puzzling things with edges and with space, like the napkin here. 
the strange right side of the painting by Cezanne. It's hard to know what we're looking at. Cezanne shows the way to this kind of suspended logic. Here at the left, he was painting a composition that defies linear perspective and gravity. I mean, how is that straw basket supported anyway? <laughs> What's the wooden leg next to it? <clears throat> how come the floor tilts up so sharply? The painter is taking liberties in order to suggest more and to create visual relationships within the picture. This is poetic license. Matisse does the same thing with his saturated blues and oranges and reds and greens. Cezanne's work had a powerful effect on Matisse in other ways. In this same year, he used <laughs> some of the uh, inheritance of his new wife uh, to buy this small painting of bathers by Cezanne, which became for him a kind of talisman, as you'll see. Several years after Cezanne painted the three bathers, just to remind you, Bouguereau, the celebrity academician and teacher that Matisse had tried uh, to, to get, get, whose classes he tried to get into, exhibited these bathers at the annual salon where decorum still ruled. Matisse also managed to buy a plaster version of this bust by Rodin, the greatest sculptor alive. It's a portrait of a radical writer, Rochefort, shown speaking with his wild hair acting out his mental energy, which Rodin emphasized with a lot of spontaneous rough modeling. Matisse was doing sculpture himself at the time. He was drawing and painting live models in the evening in a studio with other artists. Here it's an Italian model called Bevilacqua, who had posed for Rodin too. Matisse uh, painted his torso as a kind of assemblage of flat planes, like Cezanne-like, but even more accentuated with edges and colors like no other painters, blue, pink, deep red, reinforcing a mood of patient submissiveness that the legs and the curvature of the back and the neck also express. Rodin had made this life-size piece around the same time, using legs from the same model. Matisse's bronze at the right is called the Cerf, that is, slave, um, robust but downcast and expressing submission. Matisse leaves the muscles roughly modeled in the way that plaster casts are, and um, the way uh, sketches are, and um, Matisse's piece is finished, meant to be seen as we see it now. At the same time, Matisse was drawing uh, and modeling a female model. So this, this drawing made with a broad ribbed, nibbed pen was rapid, just urgent. The study in oil of a more slender model is gracefully complex in pose and probably the basis for the bronze on the right, uh, two feet high with her sort of swinging exaggeration. Matisse insisted that sculpture was the way fully to understand a figure. An outline drawing was helpful, but real comprehension came not from just looking and drawing, but also shaping with your hands. This uh, drawing of a bronze to the left by the great animal painter, uh, sculptor uh, Barre uh, of a jaguar uh, who has been, has caught a uh, an unlucky jackrabbit. Um, Matisse drew several views of this and then made a plaster replica at the bottom, which he had sent out uh, to be copied in bronze. A kind of outline drawing became a specialty, though, of Matisse, as we're going to see. But he considered the function a drawing would serve before he chose what medium he'd use, and especially here. Um, he responded to his own reaction to the subject. And when he drew, for example, after this painting by Delacroix in the Louvre, uh, 
a subject of sort of violent subject, um, he was stirred to sort of attack the paper with a furious energy of his own. Working at home, uh, he had put a model in front of a mirror and painted her from behind at an angle. So we got a bit of her reflection and a lot of her back. Both mirrors and women's backs will come back to us, to, uh, to Matisse was pretty frequently. Or at the right, he put the model at a, on a stand facing him. So we see the artist and the model. These ideas were kind of impressionist territory. And Matisse knew how to go there with terrific confidence in his own vision, plus very solid technique with paint. As he turned 30, Matisse was painting, uh, exhibiting, selling even, not getting much money, but gaining respect. In 1901, he was elected to the Society of Independent Artists, a collective of Cézanne and Gauguin and Toulouse-Lautrec and Pizarro and others who had broken in 1884 with the official salon system and its conservative juries in favor of open admissions uh, to the exhibition. A, fin a financial sc scandal in his wife's uh, family brought Matisse and his wife and three children back north to Bohun uh, to live uh, for a couple of years. In general, their life there was miserable, um, without much progress artistically and a lot of discouragement. But he kept working. The most poignant thing he painted was this. Um, in his dim, chilly studio in the attic, there's an easel and a palette and a painting and a few flowers in a tiny vase. But out the window was this blazing bright sunshine, flowers, light color. It's a picture of pitting poverty, isolation, with a vision of another life for the artist. In 1904, things took a turn for the better. The discerning Paris dealer Ambroise Vollard gave Matisse his first one-man exhibition. And he went to spend the summer at Saint-Tropez, close to where his new friend Paul Signac was living. Matisse reveled in the delicious southern light. Here at the left, the sunlight slashes across the terrace of Signac's house and leaves his wife Amélie in delicate shadows. She's wearing a Japanese kimono and she bends over her needlework this combination of warmth and opulence and domestic peace uh, was going to be a theme for him ever after. Many of you actually have been in the room where this painting, at the Gardner Museum, where this painting hangs. Uh, and like me, you didn't notice what was up there above the, the door. Uh, the light is good, though, and the picture escaped getting stolen in 1990. Apart from the weather, the attraction of Saint-Tropez for Matisse was Paul Signac himself, who was six years older, well-established. He'd inherited the informal leadership of the so-called neo-impressionist movement, or divisionists, from Surat after his death in 1990, 1890. Um, he, you saw that, the Grand Jet a moment ago, and some works by Pizarro and Van Gogh works in that style. Matisse admired Signac and his success uh, enough to study his technique up close and adopt it, or not. Matisse first painted the town uh, with an eye conditioned by Cézanne, as he had done with still life. His mentor Signac saw things differently and encouraged Matisse to try again try applying dots of color patiently. Signac, um, spots of color 
were a little more varied in shape than Surat's, but similar in the way that he used blue and red to create luminous lavender shadows. You can see in the big detail that there's very little drawing apparent, mostly masses of yellow and red and blue spots. They vary in density for different degrees of light and dark, and they vary in color, creating color zones by means of optical mixing in our brains. Proto-pixels, you could call them. You saw Matisse um, uh, try a still life five years earlier, but it didn't come naturally to him. Here's what did come naturally, a, a more traditional kind of sketching in oil with patches made of bigger strokes of particular colors, and that creating in the process an animated paint surface, uh, even impulsive looking, with bigger zones of saturated color, which suited his temperament, but which evidently annoyed and alienated Signac. This um, composition of his wife and young son by the sea at sunset was the starting point of a bigger project, a, a real test for Matisse, make an ambitious figure composition using his own version of Neo-Impressionism. The next step towards that was a small oil sketch for a scene set on the same bluff overlooking the Gulf of Saint-Tropez, but now with a quartet of female bathers standing, sitting, and reclining. And in the detail uh, here you see um, the mother is there, a uh, the woman robed, uh, robed in blue, his wife Amélie, who's set out a white cloth for tea. The small child is there, uh, standing in the middle. A sailing vessel has arrived of a type that the Mediterranean fishermen had been using since ancient Roman times. We're somewhere between modern life and an imaginary classical antiquity. In fact, a place which for centuries artists' imaginations had been dwelling. Recently, Signac, who had painted this enormous and spectacular composition nine years before, called In the Time of Harmony. <clears throat> it's 13 feet wide. It's an allegory of the future when anarchy will have changed everything. Like a lot of artists in his circle, Signac himself was an anarchist of a sort of philosophical bent rather than an agitator or bomb thrower. The title of the picture was originally In the Time of Anarchy, which he believed would be a good time. He wanted to show the Mediterranean coast after the government overthrow, when the formerly oppressed peoples would have leisure to spend in sunshine and shade, when figs and flowers would be free for the picking, down at the shore painters would paint, and in the distance liberated workers would dance in a circle, and so on. When he got back to Paris, uh, Matisse made a, a much larger study, a much larger version uh, on the left, you might compare it uh, with the study. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute the large one and a detail. And then I'll be quiet for a minute. Matisse was making a major statement. His title, Luxe, Calme et Volupté, 
was one that just about everybody at his exhibition would recognize. It's the last line of the refrain of a poem, a short ballad by Baudelaire from the Fleur du Mal called Invitation to the Voyage. It's one of the most familiar poems of the age, addressed to a lover, suggesting that she come away with him. And they live together, lava, in the southern land of delight and beauty and luxury and warmth. Utopian, but for hedonist escapists, let's say. The picture is almost four feet wide, and it made a very big impression when he exhibited it at the, uh, in the autumn of the following year. Matisse produces half tones, and not with small dots of contrasting colors that merge in the viewer's brains, but also with larger spots and dashes at wider intervals, and creates highlights at the edges of the nudes by using clotted red spots to outline them, and giving a weird kind of aura to them. And he cheats in places, reverting to blue linear outlines in several figures. Matisse found the system hard to use consistently, and pretty soon he abandoned it. Matisse, Matisse looked back at this period and said about the system of divisionism and his liberation from it, Fauvism overthrew the tyranny of divisionism. One can't live in a household that's too well kept a house kept by country aunts. Still, when it was shown in the independent exhibition, it got a lot of attention. Matisse had received an ancient, had taken and revived an ancient theme with energy and verve. Signac himself bought it for a princely 1,000 francs. And that summer, Matisse painted the still life set up in two different styles, hanging on. The same setup, two ways. It's the kind of experimental retake that Matisse did with many other subjects for most of his life. The larger one of the left is in that fluent style that he brought with him to Saint-Tropez, partly under the influence of Cezanne. The other is in the vivid new one. You might ask yourself, which one do you prefer? But you don't have to answer. Um, Matisse had made a friend a few years earlier in painting class that they had together, Andre Durin on the left. He was 10 years younger and smart and talented and headed for an engineering degree. Matisse had steered him to art. And he persuaded Durand to join him and his family in the following summer at the little village of Coulure, near the border of Catalonia. Very soon, Durand was painting colorful scenes full of life, tracking Matisse on his move away from the methods that Signac had shown them both. Here in the middle, Durin seizes on the rhythm of the drying, save, the drying sails moving back into the distance and the jumble of sardine boats on the beach, and he crops the scene tightly. Durin and Matisse challenged each other. What if you let colors tell you what shapes to make and how to combine them? These were big, brash pictures. At the left, now how do you get across the extreme contact, con contrast of light and shade in the summer on the mountains? Well, why not with big areas of orange and blue, complementary colors? And how better to get cool masses of the olive trees than with big dashes of green and blue? The companionship with Durin, who like Matisse, um, had a kind of intense and anxious personality. Uh, seems to have loosened them both up. At any rate, Durand paints his older friend up there at the right, as contained and serious. There were jokes. In the middle, uh, Durand shows Matisse on the beach. Uh, and 
at the left of that, um, he sh makes an arsonist fleeing the scene as his blazing color has setting the art world on fire. You'll remember that this picture Matisse made four years earlier in the bleak north of France, a teasing reminder that there could be a better life out there. And now Matisse had found it. The brilliant light and color, the warm, moist breezes, all that gave his senses the chance to open up, let it rip, let the brush act out of its own joy at what was there. He could float the paint on, too. Uh, he, he, no, no need for dots, no need for tidy contours, either. It's nap time, and a, a scene that is hard to imagine in painting just a few years earlier. Matisse made many, many oil sketches on the spot, along the shore and in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Some of them are motifs that he had painted on Belle Isle, like the sea rumbling onto the rocks there at the left, the scrubby vegetation in the center, and the blinding light. And at the right, the Mediterranean hills with broom flowering and making circular shapes of blue and purple. Most of it very quickly painted, as though it were on impulse. At the spot uh, on the left-hand sketch, Matisse posed his very patient wife, Amélie, in the Japanese kimono you saw earlier in Saint-Tropez. And at the right, Durin drew Matisse at work on the little easel that he carried with him on the painting in the middle. She sits on a rock uh, in a whirling mass of orange and purple and green. For the marvelous show at the Met, which many of you saw on Matisse and Durand in that summer, one of the curators described this sketch beautifully, better than I can, and so I read. It is, hard to, it is hard to distinguish the rock from the mauve and green sea, or the blue undulations in the kimono from the waves that occupy the horizon, against which the silhouette of Amélie, with her deep green chignon, does not stand out clearly. <laughs> the handling, a matter of strokes, commas, patches, is utterly free, responding only to the sensations of the painter, gripped, one imagines, by the secret and unexpected resonance between the lively motifs on the kimono and the surging waves. Here, two, ah, Two views down to the town, Durand at the left from up higher, Matisse on the right from down lower. Two canvases of exactly the same size. Now look for yourself. Durand has a clear perspective structure and emphatic zones of color. He's figured it out. He's made a finished painting. Matisse on the right is making a sketch that later on he may, back in Paris, uh, he might or might not use for a more definitive view. His composition is a third blocked by the level area in the foreground. And as for the roofs, he's made a light pencil drawing on the canvas. And into that drawing, he floats many different color patches that suggest rather than spell out what he sees. Is he imitating, or is he, is he inventing? Is he matching, or is he making? 
When he came back to Paris in September, uh, Matisse sent back a hundred or so drawings, he said, 40 watercolors and 15 canvases. So the canvases, the oil paintings of that summer have become so famous that it's easy to forget how few finished pictures there were that summer and that most of what he brought back to Paris were studies. We have many of these drawings from 1905. They're really delightful. Whether he did them with a brush and a reed pen, uh, like the one at the left, the very speedy portrait of the shrewd Miss Mongana at the left, or just fine lines in that quick study of his daughter Marguerite at the bottom, or the simple watercolor at the top of this impression of mountains, or just a humble observation like the boats and the chickens. Uh, he chose the medium in each case to suit the purpose. That autumn, Matisse made two paintings in oil of his wife that were going to demonstrate, when they were put on view, just how far he'd gone to liberate color and brushwork from their conventional descriptive roles. That was a test for an audience uh, in the autumn when he showed the two pictures and a few more at the Salon of the Independence. For some of them, the thought was, is he out of his mind, that poor man? You know, had, had, he had been a leading light uh, of the neo-impressionists, a well-behaved um, group of methodical painters, and now he and Durand and others were attacking all that. One a critic saw these paintings by Matisse and others on the walls of Gallery 7 in the exhibition. In the room with academic sculpture in the middle of the room and said, it's Donatello among the wild beasts. <laughs> Donatello parmi les veuves. And so the fauve became a nickname um, for short-lived movement. After the next couple of years, Matisse and others moved on in separate directions. But the fallout from the fauve explosion fell on more than just French artists, also all over Europe and Germany and Austria Holland, Russia. For Matisse, it was a matter of applying what he had learned with subjects close at hand. Daily domestic life um, on the right, with loose and splashy brushwork, and of course, still life, which you've seen him apply on a modest scale in a picture we began with, with eccentric and surprising composition and saturated colors. He was capable of more, more ambitious setups like this one, more surprising patterns, more courageous gestures with the brush. We'll be seeing how his audacious experiments in color and his dreams of a richer life of the senses played out in Matisse's own works in the following year and in much of his painting for the rest of his long life. So. Please join me in the next lecture and see Matisse take the next steps during the next dozen or so years in the second lecture. Thank you.